we're going to enter in the Q&A period now, and what we do is we have a couple mics up here. If you uh, have a question, just line up, get in the queue. Uh, if you're shy, go ahead, and like I said, you can tweet it to us using the hashtag CSLI. Um, we would like to, we have a broad audience here. Not everybody here is a Christian. We have uh, people of other faiths and people of no faith. We'd like to privilege those people if you have that kind of question first. So if you're of a Christian and you know of someone who's not, let them come up because we want, uh, we think that'll engender probably a, uh, a more dynamic dialogue. Uh, so we ask that. So first question, we'll go here to the left. Over here. My left, the right, stage right. <laughs> Just to really confuse yeah. everybody. Go ahead, sir. Coming up. I'm, I'm open to defer if somebody else wants to go first. Oh, All right. There you go. Can you start I, your name, actually, because then we... Uh, then yeah, we my name's going. Giovanni. Yep. Uh, thank you for being here and for clarifying the, the gospel through contrast. Um, I'm glad that you brought up justice, and I would, want, I would ask you to talk a little bit more about that. I have a Muslim friend who I was talking to about uh, kind of some of these contrasts, and uh, his comment was, that's not justice to make someone else pay for my sin and let me off. So I was wondering if you might kind of answer that by kind of clarifying the Christian view of how that's justice and how you would bridge that to someone who grew up um, in the uh, Muslim faith where I understand they kind of differentiate between sins against Allah and sins against other men. Yeah, that's a great question. Remind me of your name? Giovanni. Giovanni. Okay, great uh, question. What's, uh, what's interesting about your question, Giovanni, is that's probably the conversation I've had the most with, uh, with my Muslim friends over the years. And one of the things I always want to begin by doing, I think um, I shared that quotation, that statement from Oz Guinness at the start about compare and contrast. I think it's really important that as Christians we help our Muslim friends understand some of the Bible's teaching on this, but at the same time we do a compare and contrast, because of course in Islam there are huge difficulties too, and this issue of how can God be both forgiving and just is a huge, is a huge issue. What has God in the Quran really done about sin? Can God just turn his back and go, you know what, it's not an issue, I just forgive you, and actually still be a God who is just? And that's a huge potential problem. A related problem, and then I'll weave these together into I think how the Bible answers this question. A related problem, of course, is if the problem of sin is also not dealt with, it's not just a case of dealing with the actions we've done, it's also dealing with our proclivities to do them. And one of the fascinating areas of discussion that often uh, arises between Christians and Muslims is the whole question of what's sometimes been called original sin, that proclivity we have uh, to be rebellious and to disobey God. And interestingly, I often like to say to people, you know, I think on the one hand, original sin is perhaps the one empirically verifiable Christian doctrine, because just look around the world, or just try and behave for a week, or if you think you're a good person, get married, and your spouse will very quickly <laughs> disavow you of that belief. Now, what God has done to deal with that is hugely important, because otherwise we hit a profound theological problem. How can we ever be certain that we can, if, even if we attain paradise, we can stay in paradise? Because might we not sin in paradise and end up being cast out? Why this is important is, I talked earlier about the way the Quran uh, retells the story of Adam and Eve and makes some changes. One of the changes the Quran makes, as, uh, in contrast to the biblical story, is it relocates the action. Adam and Eve in the Quran are created up there in heaven, because when they sin, they're not cast out of paradise, out of the Garden of Eden, they're cast down. In fact, Allah's, command, Allah's curse is, get ye down from here to earth, which will be a place of trial and testing from you, for you. That raises a profound question. If Adam and Eve, our first parents in the Quran, sinned in paradise, how can we be sure the same won't happen to us? You're a good, faithful Muslim. You attain paradise. It's wonderful. Day three, you trip over a cat or you know, something bad happens, and you, do some, you sin, you curse, you do whatever, and you get cast out. And if you don't think that's a problem, it happened to Adam and Eve, it could happen to you. Now, whenever I've raised that question with Muslim friends, the response they always often come back with, and I think it's a fair question, well, don't you have the same problem? How, I mean, it's a, it's a problem for you too. And that's when I want to say, aha, wait a minute. No, it isn't. Because that difference in the understanding of sin is far deeper than that. It's not just that Jesus has paid for our sin. Uh, it's also that when you become a Christian, when you put your trust in God, one of the things the Bible promises is that God will fill you with his spirit and will begin transforming you into a new creation. And over the rest of your earthly life, there's a, there's a process of what uh, in Christian theology is called sanctification, as you are made and transformed more and more and more into, uh, into, into the likeness of Christ. And that therefore the the Andy, the Giovanni, if you're a Christian, and others here, when you step into heaven uh, at the end of time, um, 
you are not human being 1.0, you are human being 2.0. The, the upgrade has been complete. But in the Quran, there is no upgrade. There is no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There is no personal transformation. So it goes much deeper than this issue of justice. But to bring it back to justice, I think one of the things that often confuses my Muslim friends is they separate out God and Jesus. I've often had the question asked this way, well, well how, can, how can God ask Jesus to, to do this and to take, and take sin, sin into himself? That's not fair. That's not just. But Christians are not saying Jesus is just some man. They are saying Jesus is God himself come in the flesh. And therefore, God, Jesus is the sinless one who can offer to bear the sins of another because he is not just a mere human being. He is also God himself. He is the one who is just. He is the one who is completely good and holy. And all of those words the Bible applies to him, which means he is the only one who could offer to take the sin of another. And he does so voluntarily. So I think if Jesus were just a mere mortal, that would be a problem, but he is not. He is far more than that, according to the Bible, and so is the only one who can do that. Um, the book that I'd recommend as a Christian, you read, that I think that deals with this the most profoundly, and then as you reflect on it, I would unpack it and translate it to your Muslim friend. There's a wonderful book called The Cross of Christ, uh, written by a gentleman called John Stott, S-T-O-T-T. -T. And I think it's the most brilliant uh, understanding of what Jesus did on the cross in Christian theology. And even my atheist friends will, t uh, will sort of have, you know, tell, tell me it's a really helpful book for understanding the Christian perspective. Great, Joe. I hope this is, this is quick, but does it come back to the issue that we only sin against God and they have two different kind of receipts of sin? Very quickly, because I know, yeah, there are others, there are others waiting. I think... I think Islamic theology sometimes, and I say sometimes because Islamic theology is quite an amorphous sort of bundle of ideas because we have the Quran that often just alludes to things and 300, 400 years of theological development. In some, for some Muslim theologians, there is an attempt to kind of separate out sins against each other with sins against God. I think the problem with that idea is that actually because God is the one who is utterly good, God is the one who is just, God is the one who is the creator of the moral law, when you break God's moral law, if I sin against you, I am sinning against God as well. You can't separate the two out. And one of the reasons that abusing you in Christian theology is also a sin against God is because you bear the image of God in the Christian understanding. And so if I walk out there and slap you around the face, which I probably wouldn't do, you look fitter and healthier than I am, I might lose. Although KJ is a Marine, ex-Marine, so I'm probably safe up here. I haven't just wronged you, I've wronged God. And I think that's a, that's a clever theological trick that's tried, but I don't, I don't think it works. And I don't actually think it works if one reads the Quran properly either. But thank you yeah, for that first great. question. I think you were live tweeting during that. That was pretty good. Um, yeah, and so we got a lot of que um, people lining up, so if we can keep the questions concise as so, well, we'll go over here. I'll try and do the answers concisely as well. Hi, okay. my name is Emery. Is so I didn't catch your name? Emery. Emery. Hi. Uh, years ago, I worked for a Christian nonprofit resettlement agency reselling refugees out in the western suburbs. And over a period of time, I had met. Uh, and many of the refugees, of course, were mm. from all kinds of third world countries. And Mohammed was a Somali. And we became friends. I just gave him extra time, extra care, because he really needed it. He had a lot of problems. And I just served him probably 10 times more than most of the others. And we became so close. And I had shared, of course, my faith. And he shared his. And it just came to kind of a point where, what do you do? We are in such mm. alienated uh, faiths. What do we do with it? And he said to me one day, you know, I think really we are worshiping the same God, aren't we? Isn't Allah and your God maybe the same God? In my heart, I knew, no, not really. I hadn't studied or read about the Quran yet as I've done since. And I didn't know how to deal with it mm. and not lose the, the friendship. And I agreed. Mm. In my heart, I knew that was wrong. But I didn't want to just see mm. that friendship, that connection, that yeah. possible future <clears throat> witness to him uh, gone. And so shortly after that, he went off to Minneapolis, I think. So I don't know how I could have, mm. I guess I'm sharing more than, uh, yeah. if it is a question, how could I have saved the friendship and not agreed with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And I, and I also love the, the heart for your, for your friend that, that so clearly comes through in the way that you've, you've asked it. Let me share a couple of things that I've, I've sort of wrestled through and, and, and experienced over the kind of 20 years or so that I've been in, in dialogue and conversation with, uh, with, with Muslims in a number of contexts. 
I think the first thing uh, that I had to learn, I learned the, the hard way because um, one of the things about my culture, about British uh, culture, is we tend to always, you know, take the easy route and back down and, non, and, don't, and don't confront. I think, you know, we feel guilty for all of that imperial stuff we, you know, did kind of years ago. Uh, hey, you know, one of the world's greatest empires, the sun never set on the British Empire. Not, not even God would trust us in the dark. And, um, and so anyway, I would, I would always take the non-confrontation route like, you, like you've described. And then I began to realize something. I began to realize, you know, the mark of a true friendship is that you can disagree profoundly. Surely the sign of a good friendship is you can disagree. And so I began pushing out a little bit and becoming more confident. And you know, the interesting thing is, reflecting back now, over the 20 years or so I've been in some of these conversations, I have never once, never once had a Muslim friend say to me, you, I'm offended by what you've said. I, boy, I've had many tell, many tell me, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong for these reasons. Let me give you 20 reasons why I think you're wrong. And I always say, Bring that. I invite that. I'd love, to, I'd love to now discuss. But I've never been told that's offended me, and I've never seen a friendship collapse because of that. And I think one of the things that's important, this applies to the way you've asked the question, but it applies to any, converse, any, any friendship or relationship where there are differences. I think the challenge is blending together two things, particularly for us as Christians, blending together love and truth. See, truth without love can be rude and offensive. Truth without love is running up to somebody and going, you're wrong, and shouting at them, and, and triumphantly you know, waving our arguments in their face, and that, that can lose a friendship. On the other hand, love without truth is the kind of, we'll not talk about the differences, we'll just hug one another, oh, let's just talk about nice, safe things, not religion, not politics, not, the list is fairly small, um, but we'll, you know, we'll play in that area where it's safe. But that doesn't get anywhere either. Love and truth, though, can be powerful. And I think that's the question. How do you speak the truth in love to your, your friend? And the key is, allow them to do the same. Because I think you can say, look, with respect, my friend, this is what I think, but I'd love to hear what you think. And I also invite you, if you think that I'm wrong, if, and I'm sure you do want me to become a Muslim, and what, most of my Muslim friends have been very clear they want me to become Muslims, that's fine. To say, I always, I always say, I invite your questions, I invite your criticisms of what I believe. I don't want to run away from those. Then the friendship can go somewhere. So I think love and truth and... Uh, and yeah, you might be surprised uh, how, uh, how generous your, your Muslim friend will, will be. Answer. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. On the left. Yes, Over there. Thank you. My name's Chrissy. Hi, Chrissy. I have a question, a little clarification on some of the examples that you gave tonight. Yeah, do fire away. Christianity is based on the Bible under the premise that all scripture is God-breathed. So... In a couple of your illustration, illustrations, you were talking about how the burning bush story was changed in the Quran and how the Garden of Eden story was changed in the Quran. So how was the Quran written? Where did it come from? Great question. Yeah. Great. Was it pulled off the Bible? You know, yeah. Like, okay. Brilliant question. And, I, and, I, and it's a question I love, actually, because this, was my, this is actually the area of my PhD. Uh, my PhD was not so much in comparative kind of theology as uh, so I really could bore all of you for three hours uh, on this, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, I would, to go. No, 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 exactly. Go home, go home. What I will say very simply, if, uh, for, the, for the longer version of the answer I'm about to, to give you, um, if you go to the, uh, the, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, there's a website called Academia, academia.edu, and it's a, an academic website on which scholars kind of share lots of free resources. And there's a kind of 18-page kind of version of my big fat academic book on this very question up there that you might, you might enjoy, and it's uh, designed for people who know not too much about the Quran. So if you go to academia.edu, search for my my name, and you'll know it's me because you'll see my academic affiliation as Melbourne School of uh, Theology, hence the Australian tan. Um, yes, that, that was a joke. You can laugh. Thank you. Other than the pale British figure you see before you. So basically, what I would say based on my research is this, to go, the Quran retells biblical stories time and time again. And I use that, that word specifically, retells, because there was a generation of scholarship for a while. I mean, I'm, by which I'm referring to critical scholarship, Western scholarship, particularly on the Quran, that believed that what Muhammad had done is read the Bible, borrowed the stories, sort of adjusted them, edited them, and, and, and then put them into the Quran. Um, the problem is that we're now pretty convinced that the Bible wasn't available in Arabic at the time of Muhammad. We don't, we don't think that's, that's the case. The earliest translations came later. But 
we do know that the Arabia, pre-Islamic Arabia, was religiously very diverse. There were Jewish groups, there were Christian groups, there were Zoroastrians and all kinds of other different people of uh, faith uh, there in Arabia. And we also know that religious traditions and ideas were kind of circulating around pre-Islamic Arabia. We've got very good evidence for that. And it was an oral culture. So the way they circulated was storytelling. People would swap stories in the marketplace. That's how oral cultures function. And what eventually happens is this kind of pool of tradition builds up, stories that everyone's aware of. For us who are in a, a literate culture, the same kind of thing exists. You know, we talk about the kind of water cooler moments, you know, the, thing, the ideas that everyone's kind of aware of, there's, there's popular currency. And then I think what happens when Muhammad comes along uh, and begins his preaching and teaching in AD 610, what he does is fish from that pool of tradition, draw from it, uh, but does so orally and retell uh, those stories, shaping them for a, for a new audience, which is why there are both similarities and, and differences. And what my PhD basically did was ask the question, uh, what, was, what we did is I looked at uh, other oral cultures around the world, and we know of hundreds of them. And when, a, when oral tradition, like I've described, is eventually written down, it, usually there are some signs left in the written text that tell you it was generated kind of in the way I, that I've described by, by tradition being retold in front of an audience. And basically what I set out to do was go, can we find all these signs and, and clues and indicators that we know from other traditions there in the, in the Quran? And the answer is they're all over it. It looks extremely like an orally generated document which has retold stories this way. Everything that we see in other traditions we see here. So that's how I think Muhammad gets his, uh, his material. And what's interesting, of course, is then a huge controversy kicks off a few hundred years after Muhammad when, the, when Muslim scholars first get their hands on the, on the Bible. That takes a little bit longer. And uh, when Muslim scholars first get their hands on the scriptures, on the, on the, on the Christian and Jewish material, or scriptures and are able to translate them and understand them, then horror of horrors, they discover the Quran and the Bible contradict. Muhammad said they were the same. And uh, you'll hear many Muslims today who will perhaps tell you um, that they believe the Bible has been corrupted. That's a very common Muslim accusation. What's interesting, that doesn't emerge until about 200 years after Muhammad. And it comes from that period when Islamic theologians are dealing with, what do we do? These things are, are different uh, when they finally got access to the text. But oral tradition is the answer. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the okay, question. Um, we've we were going to end this at 9 p.m., so it's probably about the people in line right now. We'll cut it there. We'll be hanging here if you have questions uh, afterwards, so uh, I don't want you to get in line and be disappointed. We do have a question from um, Twitter, and the question is... In 140 characters. This will yes, be a good one. this is great. Uh, well, fortunately, Sarah is rewording them. Uh, if, the God of, if God of the Bible and Allah uh, in Islam are different, should we use Allah and God interchangeably? That's a, that's a really, really good question, and actually quite a controversial one, because depending where you go in the, uh, in the Middle East and in many parts of, uh, of Asia, um, you'll find if you talk to Christians from those cultures, they will tell you that Allah, the word Allah, is actually the generic term for God that they've been, they've been using from long before Islam. And there's a controversy because in some, not all, I have to stress this to be crucially fair, we have to be very careful in how we, uh, how, we, how we talk around some of these things that we represent fairly. In some, but not all Muslim countries, there's been a pushback and an attempt to for forbid Christians from using the term Allah uh, when they translate their Bible. So I was recently in, uh, in Malaysia um, teaching, and that's a live issue there. The government is trying to, in, in that Muslim country, is trying to forbid uh, Christian versions of the Bible when they are using the term Allah for God. But yet you talk to Malay Christians, they will say we were using that term for long before Malaysia became a Muslim country. So I think it depends on the, the context. What I would say is important is that when we talk about God, we describe which God we mean. That's important if we are Christians here this evening, if you are a Muslim guest here this evening, uh, because people use the term God very, very differently. Uh, a good example of that would be a lot of my uh, research of late has not been on Islam, but has been on atheism. Hence the book, The, uh, the Atheist who, who Didn't Exist. Shameless plug, I have to insert it in every talk. And one of the things that fascinated me, when I was, when I was researching a lot of contemporary atheism, you'll find people like uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens, many very well-known atheists, for any of you who follow these things. They, in their books, attack God, and they attack the idea of God. But as you read, if you're a Christian here or a Muslim here, and you read the descriptions of God that someone like Richard Dawkins has in his book, The God Delusion, you will find yourself thinking, this is not the kind of God I believe in. I don't believe in a God like you've described. In other words, he means something very different 
uh, by God. He believes in some kind, of, some kind of sort of malevolent supernatural psychopath. That's not the kind of God I believe in, nor any of my Muslim friends believe in. So what I would say lying behind this question, when you talk to someone who have a different faith from you, if you're a Christian engaging with a Muslim friend or neighbor, if you're a Muslim talking to a, a Christian about what you believe, always clarify what you mean. And I think a great question that Christians and Muslims can discuss in the context of friendship is what do you think about God? What's your understanding of God? What is he like? Rather than just get hung up on, on the title that we use for him, because that alone can be a fascinating conversation like I hope I've illustrated this evening. Yes, sir. Over this way. What's your name, sir? Roy, uh, Roy Axnavan. Uh, I guess, I mean, this is a great topic. Uh, at the end of this month, at the Villa Park uh, Islamic Center, they're going to be talking about the same topic. And they've asked Miroslav uh, Wolf from Yale University to come and talk to them. You've taken very much of a stand, uh, sort of an, an apologetic stand, in regards to contrasting the God of Islam and the God of Christianity. Yet missionaries oftentimes are not looking for the way to contrast the two, but trying to find common ground. And Miroslav Wolf, I think, also is sort of taking more of the generic approach to this whole topic. I know that you and he have debated on this issue. Uh, how would you uh, talk about those that are seeking to mm. bridge the, the gap rather than to yeah. contrast the gap? That's a great question, uh, Roy. I have to say, I, I, for those of you who know Miroslav Wolf, who's an extremely uh, brilliant and, and clever and smart theologian, I have never debated him. One of my colleagues has. I, would, I could only aspire to such uh, things, maybe when I've got a bit more wisdom and uh, another few inches on me as well. But, um, but yeah, Miroslav has, is a Christian theologian, for those who are not familiar with him, who, uh, who wrote a book a few years ago called Allah, A Christian Response, in which he argues that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. Now, what's interesting in that book, what I found fascinating is why he does that. Often in this discussion, the motive behind this is missed. Miroslav is very honest, he explains why. He grew up in the Balkans, he comes from the Balkan region of, uh, of Europe, of Eastern Europe, and if any of you know any uh, of the history of that, of that region, um, that was a region that was beset by kind of tribal violence, by, uh, by interreligious uh, violence, think of the Kosovan uh, war and these kind of things. And Miroslav grew up in that kind of context and, and, saw the, and saw the problems that religion can cause. And I would be the first as a Christian to say religion can cause many, many problems. Religion per se doesn't solve necessary problems, it can cause as many as it solves. And so Miroslav in his book says, you know, the best way, one way to solve the problem of violence, especially between Christians in, I'm always careful to put that in quote marks, and Muslims in quote marks, is to perhaps affirm we worship the same God, because that would bring us closer together. That's his motive. I think the motive is laudable. I think, though, it confuses the project he then sets about. Firstly, believing in the same God doesn't solve the problems and the trouble spots of the world. Look at Sunnis and Shiites, the two major sects of Islam who have been fighting each other since the late 600s, uh, early 600s, in fact, and huge loss of life in things like the Iran-Iraq war. They believed in the same God. They followed the same religion, just a minor variation of it, but it didn't solve that particular problem. Furthermore, I think the other thing that Miroslav does, I think when you are so looking for similarities, you can miss the differences. Now, both are important. Both are important. We want to talk about similarities, yes, but there are also profound differences. Uh, a car and an Airbus A380 are both made of metal and both have wheels, but they are very, very different vehicles. Be what we can talk about the similarities. They're both transportation devices, but talk about the, the differences too. Now, I agree with you. When we're trying to build friendships with our Muslim friends, and if we're Muslims here this evening trying to build friendships with Christian friends, let's talk about the similarities. Sure, let's talk about the fact we believe in a God who is a creator, that we believe in a God who brought everything into being, a God who has, uh, has uh, revealed something of him, something of, a, of, of instruction through Scripture, a God who has sent prophets, and these kind of things. But let us also be honest about the, the differences, because if we don't do that, I don't think we're being... We're being honest. And one last thing I'd say on Roy on this that I think is profoundly important. If we force the differences together too much, we actually do violence to the two things. Because if my Muslim friends believe the same as I do, and now to be fair to Miroslav, he's not saying Christianity and Islam are the same, but there are some who would go further than him. If the person I'm dialoguing with believes exactly the same as me, I don't need to listen to them because they're a carbon copy of me. If, however, they believe something different, now I need to listen. I need to catch the nuance. I need to say, hang on a minute, what do you mean when you say that 
word. And you and I, I know we've talked before, I mean, those of us who've studied the Quran, for example, you know, know that uh, some of the words that are used in the Quran and that are also used in the Bible mean very different things than those two scriptures. So I think to understand, we need to look on both the differences and the similarities, but with the same motive, that we want to build friendships, we want to build understanding, we want to represent each other fairly, but also for those of us, of course, who are Christians, we then also want to draw our Muslim friends to who we believe God really and fully is as revealed uh, in Jesus Christ. And I make no apologies for wanting my Muslim friends to encounter Christ. And I have no problems with them looking at me and wishing I would become a Muslim. Because if we love our friends and we believe that the revelation of God that we are following is true, we surely want our friends to follow the same. I hope some of that helps. Sir? Over here. Hi, what's your name? Uh, hi, my name is Ian. Uh, I was just wondering, you used a lot of uh, biblical scripture, and you used it very well, but um, it might be because you don't feel yourself as much of an authority on um, Islam as you do Christianity, but I was just wondering, why didn't you use uh, like straight-up Islamic scripture and so that we could directly compare it with... Yeah, that's a good question. And um, the interesting thing, actually, when I, when I first did this presentation, I've been sort of presenting on this for years, I used to actually use a lot more of the, of the Quran. And then what would often happen is uh, my Muslim friends in the audience would often come up and say, well, no, hang on, you've misunderstood what the Quran says. No Muslim thinks that. And so actually I've shifted to using people like Shabir and Ismail and others because these are people who've studied the Quran in huge detail, more than I have. I mean, I've been studying it for 20 years. I read Quranic Arabic, but I have not studied it to the detail that say Shabir has. And so I'd rather use these folks as a, as a lens because then I can say, what I'm saying is believed by mainstream, orthodox, hugely respected Muslim scholars. I'm not just cherry-picking verses, and that's the accusation. In fact, you know, uh, you know, if you wanted to be naughty, you could say, well, hang on, you've quoted Exodus 15, but you haven't quoted Exodus 16 and other kind of things. So that was the, the comparison. What I'd encourage uh, folks to do, if you want to dig into the Quran itself, it's a difficult book to approach the first, the first time. It's a very hard book, particularly if you're coming from a Christian background of any kind. What I'd encourage you to do, there's a, there's a couple of really helpful ways into the Quran that you can go and explore some of the things I've talked about to read it uh, for yourself. Um, there's a wonderful book called, um, by a gentleman called uh, Fazl Rahman called the Quran, um, major, I think it's called Major Themes of the Quran is the title of the book, and it will walk you through the major themes of the Quran, and you can, you can look at some of the stuff that he covers. And there's also, for those of you who are more, uh, more internet users, there's a really helpful website uh, produced by, the, by, a, by, a Muslim, by a group of Muslim scholars at the University of Leeds in England, and the website is corpus, C-O-R-P-U-S dot Quran dot com, and it allows you to pretty much dig into the, the Arabic text of the Quran without knowing Arabic. It's the closest you can get without knowing that. It's a brilliant tool, so you can do things like what I talked about, the love of God, that, that analysis that I gave you of those 28 uses, you can reproduce that yourself in about three minutes because you can just look up any verse in the Quran that uses the word love, click on the word love in the, in the Arabic, bang, it will give you all the statistics. So you can dig into that. But that's the kind of reason why I really wanted to, to show that my understanding and my reflection of what the Quran has to say is, uh, is demonstrated there by, by those who interpret it and teach it for a living. But you raise a great question. And what's funny, one of these days, like about the second person in the last kind of year who's asked that, one of these days I'll get bored of quoting Shabir and I'll flick back the other way and I can then guarantee what will happen. Somebody will come up and go, why don't you quote modern Muslims? Nobody believes what you believe. <laughs> but you've, that's a great, but you, it's a great question and a fair question. So thank, thank you for you. asking it. We've got a little more than 10 minutes. So 10 probably minutes. about two more questions, but uh, we'll be uh, standing around here for a few minutes for those of you who don't make it. So probably two more. And Isaac, I'm going to skip you because you get to see him Saturday. So <laughs> sorry. So this way. Sir. What's your name? Hi, good evening. My name is Jesse. Jesse. So we hear this, t this term extremists in the media all the time. Do, does a group like ISIS, an extreme group, um, basically my question is, are they really extreme or are they worshiping a God that you described in Allah? Gosh, there's a, there's, there's a question. <laughs> no, I think it's a, I, I say it's a, it's a question because I think for a number of reasons, it's a very, very difficult 
question. Let me, let me give it a context and I'll do my best to answer it. It's a very sensitive question because the majority of Muslims that you meet here uh, in, a, in the USA are going to be wonderful, peace-loving, community-orientated men and women who just want to raise families, make a difference in their communities in the same way that you, you or I would. And many of them are deeply, deeply, deeply pained by what's being done in the name of the religion uh, they love. I regularly have conversations with Muslim friends who are times in tears about what's going on in the Muslim world. So I think we just need to recognize that with, with sensitivity and not kind of wade in and, and hurt people by what, we, what I'm about to say. So I want to I want to try and uh, be honest in addressing the question, but also sensitive to those here who may be from a Muslim background. What I would say, though, is this. There are, what's interesting, when you look at what those extremist groups are doing, they certainly are claiming in their language and their pronouncements that they have the texts on their side. It's very interesting if you look at the pronouncements of a group like, like ISIS, because you mentioned them, they will quote the Quran. They will quote other kind of uh, Muslim or, or scriptural authorities. And when you read the Quran, the Quran definitely speaks with a number of voices on this issue. There are Quran verses that are problematic, would be the, the diplomatic way of saying it, that, are, that, that, do, that could be used on their own to support violence. There are also Quran verses that are very, very peaceful and engaging and, in, and speak of respect and dialogue versus a talk of no compulsion and religion and you know, truth stands out clearly from error, those kind of verses. Now, the problem is, if the, all we had was the Quran, then, of course, we could come along and pick whichever verse we wanted. If you were inclined towards violence, you could pick a violent verse. If you were inclined to being moderate, you could pick a, a moderate verse. This was a problem in early Islam. And the first generation of Muslim scholars were faced with the issue of how do, what do you do where the Quran appears to say two different things? Because it can't contradict in Islamic theology. It's the, it's, the, it's the revelation of God. What do we do with it? And the solution they arrived at was where the Quran very clearly seems to say two different things. What you do is you work out which verse was revealed earlier and which verse was revealed later. This is why the biography of the life of Muhammad is so important uh, to Muslim scholars interpreting the Quran, because it allows you to kind of put the verses in some kind of chronological order. There is no obvious chronology in the Quran. And the later verses supersede or abrogate, is a, is a technical term, the earlier verses. Where the difficulty arises is most of those violent verses are the later ones, and most of the peaceful verses are the earlier ones, which reflects, if you know anything about Muhammad's biography, that he moves from, from sort of peace and, and tolerance and inclusion, that's not quite the right word, but basically those kind of things in the earlier part of his career, and then from 622 to AD onwards, he gets into political power in Medina, and there the kind of whole nature of the Quran changes. And it's there that the doctrine of jihad, for example, begins, that word that has become a very loaded term that we're all familiar with. Which means, I guess what I'd be comfortable saying is, it is easier to build a theology of, of extremism than it is of moderation based on that basis. And if you wish to be a, a moderate, as thankfully, you know, and wonderfully so many of my Muslim friends are, although they have dialogued with radicals too over the years, um, that's a little bit harder because you have to get behind 1,400 years of tradition. Now, it can be done. And the person who I think has, is tr one of, the, one of the, the real heroes for me in some of this stuff are those Muslim scholars who are willing to stand up and say we have an issue here. There's a wonderful uh, lady who's based in Toronto. Her name is Rahil Raza, uh, R-A-H-E-E-L, Raza, R-A-Z-A. And she's produced a documentary called Islam by the Numbers. And what she does in that documentary, she starts at the beginning and she says, I am a Sunni Muslim. I love my religion. I am not in any sense wanting to you know, attack it. But nevertheless, we, as Muslims, she says, we have to address some difficult questions and some face up to some issues. And she goes on in that 15-minute documentary to address some of the stuff I've just talked about. I'd encourage you to watch it because I think you'll find it very, very helpful and also encouraging to hear there are Muslim voices. There are, really, speaking up about this stuff. So I hope that helps in, in framing some of the answer. Um, it's a complex issue, uh, but, uh, but ISIS certainly stand in a very broad strand of tradition that goes right back to the very beginning of Islam. They are not the only one, although they have obviously come to predominate, I think, in some ways in the last few years. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Sir, on the left. Over here. Hello, I'm James. James. Uh, I hail from Chicago, so. Wonderful. Um, so we are talking about the object of worship 
um, and which is the Trinitarian God. And so um, when, how do we essentially describe that or even like have a discussion about that when there is such a, uh, there are so many differences uh, that are needing to be reconciled within the church. So I'm looking more inward towards mm. the body of Christ. Yep. Um, where I think I learned this the other day, it was like status confessionis and audiophora. And so status confessionis is like things that like are undisputable, undisputably Christian. And then audiophora is more like things that like you can choose to do or not. Um, so I feel like with the church, the global church, there are so many things that we differentiate on, um, on how we even like see the Trinitarian God uh, from here and like the global South, like, you know, areas where they have like a mixture of culture and mm. um, the Christian faith. So how do we essentially present that yeah. to our uh, Islamic friends? Mm. Uh, but also um, if God is the one who brings us to God, is there, I, I feel like everyone here is like, there's a sense of urgency and that's why there's such an interest in yeah. this kind of discussion is that we all have some kind of connection to is like some, form of Muslim yeah. friendship or relationship. And so if God <clears throat> is the one to bring us to God, is there a need for urgency? Is there a need for like Oh that gosh. Kind of, yeah. That's about five questions Sorry. in one ju- No, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's a great question. Well let me start with the let me start with the unity and, and diversity question. I think that's a hugely important question. Um, early on, I can still remember some of my very early kind of conversations with Muslim friends back in London in the late nineteen nineties and and I was still had so much to learn and everything was very new and every question was a challenge. And my Muslim friends asked wonderful questions, brilliant questions. And one of the questions they would often raise is the, is the unity question. I'd often hear things like, you know, one of the things that shows that Christianity is false and Islam is true is Islam is completely united and, is, and Christianity, you know, you guys invent a new den- denomination before breakfast. I mean, you can't agree on anything. Now, On the one hand, that's a false dichotomy because the more you study Islam, the more you go. Islam is extremely diverse, hugely diverse. Not just the main sects, Sunni, Shiite, and and Sufi. Shiism is is divided into lots of different sects and schools. Sufism is a multi-fractured kind of entity. And then even within mainstream Sunni Islam, uh, I've met so many different Muslims. Uh, and in fact, to the extent that uh, you know, some scholars have said it's better not to talk of Islam, but Islams, and never assume that you know, your Muslim friend believes the same as the, your previous your Muslim friend. I, I think you know, there's a difference there. But for Christians, though, the question had a, had, had a very good sting to it, because I think we do unity extremely badly, extremely badly. It's tragic the way that Christians sometimes speak of one another and the dis- Unity. It breaks, it breaks my heart. I have been on university campuses where like three campus groups on the same campus won't sit down and pray with each other because of something that was said to somebody, you know, three years ago. And uh, it is an absolute travesty. So I think for those of us who are Christians, we have got to take unity really crucially seriously. It doesn't matter if you think the person sitting next to you is a theological lunatic. If they love and follow Jesus Christ, you have at the least to go, this is a brother or sister for whom Christ died, and I have to, even though I may disagree with them, I still love them and befriend them and offer them the hand of friendship, because the Bible takes that so deadly seriously. One of the last things Jesus says to his followers is he, in that great prayer in John 17 from memory is, you know, Father, let them be one as you and I are one. Jesus prays for, for unity. So I think we've got to take this very, very seriously. At the same time, we can also get hung up on unity in the sense of we can sometimes get panicked and go, well, unless we can agree on everything, you know, how can how can we stand firm on anything? There's also a surprising degree of uniformity when you look at the major Christian denominations, when you look back through church history. there is an astonishing amount of unity about the things that really matter, about the identity of God, about the identity of Jesus, about his death and resurrection and atonement for, for sin. And in fact, C.S. Lewis, you know, whose name stands behind the institute that's organized this evening, he wrote this amazing little book called Mere Christianity. And if you haven't read it, it's a wonderful read. And he picked that term because he was writing this apologetic, this presentation of the Christian faith for people who knew nothing of Christianity. And he wanted to sit down and go, okay, what are the things that all Christians agree on that I can you know, commend and describe and defend? And, uh, and he, th- thus he presents what he calls mere Christianity. And there's an awful lot of material uh, in there. So I think 
we need to, as Christians, take unity seriously, but we need to, as well, realize there's an awful lot that, you, that unites us that doesn't separate us. In terms of where you, where you landed it on, on God leading us to Him, I think one of the things that is really, really helpful for those of us who are Christians here this evening and all of our discussions to always bring it back to, to Jesus, because I think He is the great unifier. What tends to divert is actually our clever man-made theological systems. You know, where I tend to start looking down on my brothers and sisters in Christ is when I start thinking, well, I'm pretty smart. I've got my PhD. I've worked a few things out. You know, this guy over here is, an, is a stupid dunderhead, quite frankly, because he couldn't reason his way out of a paper bag. I'm, not, I'm pointing over here, not any one person in particular. <laughs> Someone over here looking horribly offended. Um, and to go, I think one of the things that consistently amazes me about the gospel is it's the only belief system if you properly live out Christianity the way that Jesus uh, taught it and proclaimed it that destroys pride and destroys superiority because the gospel says that you are not saved because of your knowledge, because of your theological brilliance, because of your amazing moral life, or because of some incredible mountaintop experience you had. You are only saved and reconciled to God because of what Jesus has done in the cross, which means you have absolutely zero basis for looking down on anybody else. But any religion that tells you that you achieve salvation or wisdom or nirvana or a higher state of existence through knowledge, through knowing the right stuff, through mastering truth, perhaps as in Buddhism, through having the right mystical experience, through being a good person, that is inexorably going to lead to a sense of superiority. I am a more moral person than KJ. I know more than KJ. I've had more experiences than KJ. Therefore, how do I avoid being a person who feels superior? On the other hand, if the only reason I'm, I am right with God is because of what he did in Jesus Christ, I have no basis for that at all. It destroys superiority, and it builds unity, because he and I are both sinners for whom Christ died, without whom we would be nothing, and all basis for boasting is gone. So I think keeping our eyes, for those of us who are Christians, fixed on Christ can solve some, not all, but many of these problems. But thank you for raising that that question, because it's one we need to take more seriously than we do. Yeah. Well, we have come to the, we've come to the time at the end of our evening, so um, one, I want to thank you for coming. The three of you here, if you stay, we'll get your questions answered, but we don't want to maintain a captive audience anymore. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, if, if you're a C.S. Lewis fellow, uh, please do me a favor, raise your hand. Ray, there you are. So if you've got questions, because uh, I can't spread myself out, grab one of the fellows who raise their hands. We'd love to share more about the Institute. If this is the kind of thing that interests you, uh, make sure you're on our mailing list. We'll do more events like this. Our motto is discipleship of the heart and mind. And if you've listened to Andy talk in the past, he'll talk about it not just being intellectual, even emotional, but also engaged in the imagination. And that's what we want to do, is to engage your hearts and minds and help you be imaginative as you try to live out the, uh, the life of faith. Uh, a mentor of mine has once said that it takes imagination to live out the life of faith. And C.S. Lewis embodied the use of imagination.